If I can have your attention, please. We'd like to start the fifth and final panel of this conference on the implications for U.S. foreign policy of the war on terror. Ladies and gentlemen, you've all uh, sat through wonderful discussions during these two days, which have tangentially and in passing referred to some issues related to U.S. foreign policy, and now we're going to tackle that subject directly. You've heard discussion of Iraq, you've heard discussion of Islamofascism, you've heard discussion of the question as to whether Al-Qaeda is on the run or on the ascendancy. Uh, some have talked about the question of freedom as an antidote to terrorism, uh, and you've talked about, they've talked about the militaristic approach uh, to fighting terrorism. Now, the panel we have is a very distinguished one, uh, which will uh, give you <coughs> perhaps different views uh, than you've heard so far and perhaps from each other on the American foreign policy uh, issue directly. Uh, I, guarantee, I have not seen their presentations. Uh, they didn't share them with me in advance uh, or with each other, but I guarantee you will find them interesting. Our first speaker, and we're, we're following the order in the program, will be Dr. John Esposito, who has gained a widespread reputation as a scholar of Islam, political Islam, and international relations. He's taught at several universities, including this one. He's lectured widely and served as a consultant to the State Department, to governments, and corporations. He's published more than 20 books, including Holy War, Terror in the Name of Islam. Currently, he's at Georgetown University, where he's professor, a university professor, professor of religion and international affairs, and the founding director of the Center for uh, Muslim Christian Understanding. Let me briefly mention the other speakers. Uh, the second speaker will be Ambassador Kofor Black, who has had a long and very distinguished career working in the U.S. government on issues directly related to our panel topic. He spent 28 years at the Cent Central Intelligence Agency, including a period as director of its counterterrorism center. He also had tours abroad for CIA, he then served at the State Department between 2002 and 2004 as counterterrorism coordinator and ambassador at large. Ambassador Black is now vice chairman of Blackwater USA, a private firm. Our third speaker will be Mr. Rami Khoury, a prominent journalist, editor, and commentator who is internationally syndicated and widely known around the world. You've probably heard him on NPR or seen him quoted in our press since he has written for the Boston Globe, the Financial Times, the Washington Post, and other papers. He's been chief editor of the Jordan Times, executive editor of the Daily Star, and today he is editor-at-large for the Daily Star. He's also now the director of the Issam Ferris Institute for Public Policy at the American University in Beirut, where he also teaches. Finally, our discussant, Dr. Shukata Bose, is a distinguished scholar whose main areas of research are modern South Asia and the history of the Indian Ocean region. He's also taught at various universities and published a number of highly regarded books and other works. Currently, Dr. Bose is the Gardner Professor of Oceanic History and Affairs at Harvard University in its Department of History. We'll begin with Dr. Esposito. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Bill, and, and I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I think this is the main room that I taught at uh, all the years that I was here. Um, you know, let me begin by saying that uh, speaking at the end of a conference is a bit difficult because um, you've had a lot of experts here talking about things, and I'm, what I'm going to do in the beginning is actually um, repeat um, some things that I'm sure uh, others have said as a way of background to uh, some main points that I want to make. But I hate those things. But um, um, I'll just leave it there. I just lost my name tag. That's, it's not as bad as I started carrying one of these things and I was walking through an airport on a speaking engagement and suddenly realized my pants were literally coming off me. They're so damn heavy and I usually leave it in my belt. And I didn't know how to say to the person I was walking with. So here I am, my age, sort of like walking along and pulling up my pants as I'm walking along. And finally I said, can we stop? I think I'm losing my pants. But anyway, <laughs> I promise, Layla, I won't do that here. Um, well, how should U.S. policy against uh, uh, terrorism be evaluated five years later? One of the questions that Bill put to me. On Wednesday, the morning after the President Bush's State of the Union address, I received an email uh, from a colleague. Um, 
uh, whose response was, we need regime change at home. That's where they thought we should start. Um, now, five years later, what, what can we say about where we are? Despite modest success, and I would emphasize modest, the world is a much more dangerous place, not safer. The human cost, most importantly, and the economic cost can hardly be justified, and I would underline that, can hardly be justified. Um, Anti-Americanism has increased globally, as we heard before, but, you know, given the way we've handled things, you don't need polls to tell that. You can pretty much predict by the way we handle our policy that that's just going to continue. But I think what's important is whenever we say anti-Americanism has increased incrementally, a lot of people simply focus on, aha, so that's, the problem is it's increased and it's increased among them. So that's going to make them more extremist. The point is it's increased globally, not just in the Muslim world. And I think that that makes a big difference. As a colleague of mine from Europe, we were working on a project, and she was asked um, how the particular country she comes from, how people in her experience are viewing America. And she kept saying, and her English is perfect, she kept saying, well, they're really not happy, they're really pretty upset. I said, you mean despised? She said, yeah, that's the word, I didn't want to use it, um, in some circles. Uh, on the other hand, we know that uh, in many parts of the Muslim world, in many Muslim communities, it, the, the war against global terrorism continues to be viewed as a war against Islam in the Muslim world. And it doesn't help when a lot of people like to say, well, that's stupid, that shouldn't be said, and they don't focus on why that's the case. And I'll come back to that. Neither Iraq nor Afghanistan can be pointed to as success stories, far from it. They're both in uh, very precarious situations in which America is seen as part of the problem, not the solution. And yet the fear is that without a strong Western presence, things will get worse. So what to do? It's a little bit like for those of us who speak around the country, and if you've been critical of the Bush administration, you know, some... <clears throat> my Brooklyn language was going to be used, but I think this is being recorded, so um, then I'll fall back on a more white Anglo-Saxon Protestant approach. Um, <laughs> some people... Uh, you know, are want to say, well, if you're critical of President Bush, what would you do? I find that to be the most incredible question in the world, in a way, because you have an administration that is so, from my point of view, so screwed things up that, uh, you know, to turn around to somebody and say, where's, where's your alternative plan? I mean, this is where I really feel at times with some of the Democrats, because, uh, you know, you, you critique Bush and immediately somebody says, and the Democrats don't have a plan, and you want to say, my God, you know? You create that kind of situation to think that somebody's going to be able to come up with a plan that somebody, especially if the administration that created it can't come up with a plan for a mess that they created, that, that the Democrats are going to come up with one overnight or any alternative party um, is putting somebody in, it seems to me, an untenable position. The administration in particular, and I think this is important, I'll come back to it later, has failed, failed um, dismally, abominably, to deliver on its pledge to promote democracy in the Middle East and to reinvigorate the roadmap. If anything, it's mishandling or sitting on its hands more precisely during the Israeli wars in Lebanon and Gaza. The cutoff of aid in order to destabilize a democratically elected Hamas, whether one likes Hamas or not, has undermined its credibility. What are the chances the U.S. will succeed in preventing another 9-11? Well, Regrettably, you know, to simply say it'll require another administration says nothing. Uh, it all depends on who the person is who becomes president. You know, so, for example, people who say, well, we need to, you know, bring in a Democratic administration depends on which Democrat we get in terms of the, terms of the approach, let alone the magnitude of the problem. But I certainly think an area that's important, and I'm going to expand on this, is the area of public diplomacy. I'm one of those people who believes in that. Now, shortly after 9-11... Can I have that water, please? Uh, great. No, that one right there. It's, uh, great, thank you. I started my day at 3.30, so it's a little... <laughs> great, thanks. Um, um, shortly after 9-11, uh, one of the senior people in the State Department brought together a group of Arab and Muslim leaders. I was invited simply because I, I run a, a center that deals with that part of the world. And... Uh, the person said to this group at the beginning, twice during the meeting, and at the end, kept looking at the group and said, I know you're not going to believe this. I know you've heard this before, but um, this Secretary of State, meaning Colonel Powell, and I think what he was saying was true in terms of Mr. Powell, um, uh, believes that public diplomacy is more than just public relations. It's also about foreign policy. And he said, as we speak, the Secretary is on the phone 
with either the, the leader of Palestine or Israel. He said he's calling them, you know, one after the other, and saying to them, until you both recognize you're part of the problem, you can't be part of the solution. You know, you may see yourself in different ways as, as part of the problem. And he's going to say the same thing to the leaders of India and Pakistan, etc. Well, as we all know, the State Department was generally Trump by defense, and that approach really never took off. And it's always had a problem taking off. That is, looking at the foreign policy component and always thinking that they just don't understand this. And if we just try to make it clearer to them who we are, or if we just bring as many delegations as we can from the Arab and Muslim world, I'm not against it, but you know, bring as many imams as you can, bring as many you know, young people as you can, uh, that's going to make it go away. And on the other hand, we don't you know, deal with the really tough issues, which I'll, I'll come to later. Um, and you'll see I'm not that optimistic. But if, if we look at, at public diplomacy, uh, and look at public diplomacy in a world in which things are getting worse, and in a world in which Islamophobia is becoming greater and greater, so much so that the secretary, the former uh, uh, secretary general of the UN held an international conference on Islamophobia two years ago and said, you know, it's really a sad day when you have to have a conference on Islamophobia. And what's interesting is the number of people that have a problem with Islamophobia. That is, have a problem with the idea that one talks about Islamophobia. See, it's okay to talk about anti-Semitism, but not Islamophobia. That is to be just dismissive of it and say, oh, really, that's exaggerated. I really don't want to use that word, etc." Well, if you look at the situation in Europe and in the United States, we've got, we've got that, that, that situation quite strongly. And it, and it continues to affect um, issues uh, such as uh, civil liberties. Now, let's talk then about public diplomacy for a while. And what I'd like to share with you is some data from a Gallup World Poll. And then after that, I'm going to draw some conclusions with regard to policy specifically. This is a Gallup World Poll, which will be carried on every year for the next 100 years. Every year for the next 100 years. Um, and within that is a project called Listening to the Voices of a Billion Muslims. Listening to the Voices of a Billion Muslims. And that project will be done every year. I have signed on as a senior scientist. Any project I sign on with, I finish. So as I like to say at Georgetown, with regard to succession, Anybody who comes in is like Charles waiting for mommy to retire. No, I'm only kidding. Don't let that get back to Georgetown. I'm only kidding. There are a lot of people who I'm sure would like to move into succession. But this is going to be done for 100 years, and, and it is being uh, done by Gallup with no support from outside paying for that. However, Gallup then sells its data, so it's, it's a different approach from other groups. But it, it literally is looking at Muslim, uh, Muslims from North Africa, to Southeast Asia, and plus or minus 3%, it is the equivalent of looking at a billion Muslims. Now, um, I just want to give you a little bit of a sense of what some of the data winds up telling us. Let's start with an initial breakout. Some of this, by the way, is in a piece um, that um, uh, I co-authored that's in uh, foreign policy called What Makes Muslims Radical. It's on their website, um, and uh, they say it got the most hits in 2006, 100,000 unique hits. The reason was it's so short. Everybody not only hit it, but decided to read it, because they thought it was amazing, and I thought, even I would read it. It's six or eight pages. I mean, you can get through it. Um, but I want to share some of what, what's there and some of the attitudes. Number one, we identify uh, two categories, moderate Muslims. Uh, these are people who say that 9-11 was not justified, and then have other positions, which I'll talk about, and then potential radicals, those who say uh, and insist, even now, that 9-11 was justified, and they have certain characteristics. But what's interesting is taking a look at the profile. For example, uh, there's a tendency to think that, that moderates and radicals are necessarily very different in a number of areas, when in fact they're um, fundamentally quite similar in many areas. There is no difference, for example, in religiosity between moderates and radicals. In fact, radicals are no more likely to attend religious services regularly than are moderates. If we talk about radicals, we'd be talking about the radically rich. That is, this 7% of people who are potential radicals, uh, these are not people who commit acts of violence. What we maintain is they are potential radicals in that given the way they see the world, U.S. policy, some could be open to recruitment depending on circumstances, and, and you'll see why in a second. But when we talk about their financial profile, in fact, radicals are not poorer. They're in much better economic shape uh, on average than uh, most moderates are, and are better uh, educated. So better educated, have better incomes, go to school longer. 
they are also more hopeful about their future, which is interesting. They're more hopeful uh, than, uh, than the moderates are with regard to uh, the future. And indeed, uh, see things as getting uh, better in the next five years. Okay. Now, when we get to the question of why do they hate us, the radicals hate our way of life, our freedoms. The president repeated that the other day. They just, you know, they, they just hate our, our freedom, etc. Uh, both matter, moderates and radicals in the Muslim world admire the West. In particular, its technology, democratic system, freedom of speech, work ethic. All of these things are there. Both have that admiration. Well, where's the difference? Where's the difference? The significant difference has to do with how radicals perceive the world as, as distinguished from moderates. That is that radicals feel more intensely being, poli uh, being politically under siege and the danger of being politically under siege. Radicals feel more intensely um, the sense that uh, the United States and the West operate with a double standard when it comes to democratization and human rights. Moderates also feel strongly about that, but moderates tend to be more concerned with the economic side. So, Radicals are concerned with the economic side, too, jobs, employment, et cetera. But their overwhelming sort of concern and perception um, is the danger of dominance, uh, hegemony, uh, further humiliation before the world, uh, impotence, et cetera. And you can see where, therefore, the playing out of certain policies, whether it's invading a country or the way in which we sometimes talk, whoever we are in the West, about you know, controlling their, their resources, uh, their economic resources, et cetera, would play into it. So in an interesting kind of way, both moderates and radicals have similar concerns, but at the end of the day, the radicals prioritize the political and, the, and, and, and feel more intensely the sense of, of being under siege and, and, as it were, the threat of the, of the West um, than do the moderates. However, what's also interesting is that radicals tend to believe even more strongly that democracy would be the way out, but they also believe even more strongly that it's never going to come. That is, that self-determination, real self-determination is not going to come. That if democracy comes, it will be an American brand of uh, democracy. Okay. Now, just a, uh, a few more. How much time do I have? Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay, great. Great. Don't worry about that. Um, all right. Let me make a few more observations then, uh, just to summarize that, and then I'll, I'll refer to some specific policy observations. Focusing on the attitudes of those with radical views and comparing them with moderate majority results in the following kinds of uh, findings. When asked what they admire most about the West, both extremists and moderates state technology, the West value system, hard work, fair political systems. Okay? Now, no significant, no significant difference exists with regard to the question, do you want better relations with the West? Does it concern you a lot? That's also there, very much out front. But when it comes to democracy and the promotion of democracy, there is that disjuncture that I talked about. Now, let's bring it back then to public diplomacy in the West and the Muslim world. One of the myths that we discover in our surveys is that both people in the West and in the Muslim world believe that the other side doesn't care, when in fact it's only about roughly 11%. Each side says it cares, but the distinctive difference is as follows. Both, uh, uh, particularly uh, Americans in, in this case in terms of uh, polling, uh, and people in the Muslim world agree on the public diplomacy as public relations. We need to get to know each other better. Education, uh, media programs, etc. They both agree on that, but with Americans, it's full stop after that. The issue of foreign policy doesn't come up. Whereas when you're dealing with Muslims across the world, foreign policy comes in. And then the issues of respect us, respect our religion, don't dominate, uh, don't dominate us. Uh, that is all out there. The Palestinian issue is out there. However, on the American side of things, it, it, it just doesn't show up. Also, the approach to relations is a little different. When Americans in a recent poll, and you could have seen this, I think it was a Gallup USA Today poll, were asked, uh, what do you admire about Islam? Something like 33% said nothing, and another 22% or 25% said, I don't know. So that's about 57% with a negative attitude. Okay? When the same question is asked of Arabs and Muslims, you have nowhere near that kind of response or percentage. That is, only a very small percentage will, will in effect, blow us off. 
and in fact, significant numbers will talk about what they admire. They'll also talk about what they don't like, but they'll talk about the things that they admire by way of, uh, by way of background. Um, now, what I want to talk here about is, in conclusion, uh, what are the chances the U.S. will succeed uh, in preventing another 9-11? What, what are some of the policies that we need to think about? Okay. There are a number of policies, and I don't say this is the first one, but it should be high up on the list. Israel and Palestine. Everybody says that. I've been hearing that my whole career. When I got into this profession, which was uh, too long ago, I remember thinking that I felt sorry for the poor you-know-whats who were retiring, who had been in the field, because, you know, how can you be in a field for 25 or 30 years, you retire, and it, it hasn't gotten better, you know? It's, and I was sure in my lifetime things would get better, Okay. The, in terms of Palestine and Israel. And Oslo came along. I wasn't happy about Oslo, but I felt at least there's some positive momentum. The end of the 20th century, I was giving talks about how the 21st century might be the century of Islam, i.e. Muslims in America and Europe were developing. Uh, there was more awareness of Islam. I knew there was a, a negative side. Post 9-11, situation couldn't, po could, couldn't be worse. Okay? That's the background. Now, Palestine, Israel. The fact is, nothing's going to happen, and therefore, it's not going to get better. Easy to say. No American administration, Democrat, Republican, whatever persuasion, has been willing to really bite the bullet on that. To really bite the bullet means an absolutely even-handed approach. And no administration and no Congress will do that. They simply won't. Now, if there's some miracle, if there's divine intervention, etc., maybe that'll happen, but I'm not optimistic. And I'm not saying that's the only issue, but it is a major issue. And I, I'm not optimistic about that one at all. Um, okay. Democratic exceptionalism. On the one hand, Mr. Haas, when he worked uh, for the administration, uh, and we were going to go in and said, into Iraq and said there are no weapons of mass destruction, acknowledged that all administrations had practiced democratic, ex uh, democratic exceptionalism. We promote democracy every place but the Middle East and Muslim world. But the reality of it is, even though the Bush administration in its second term has said that it is going to promote democracy in the roadmap, from my point of view, it never intended to really do it. And I think part of the problem any administration that comes in is going to have is, again, is it going to bite the bullet on democracy too? I think it's better if we don't say things. If we say things and we don't deliver on it, in a world in which people are used that we don't deliver on it, and then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, you just build ever stronger levels of cynicism. Not just look at Palestine and Israel. Look at what happened in Lebanon. I mean, it was, if you read the Israeli press, you had Israeli commentators commenting when Condoleezza Rice would go overseas, why are you coming here? You're going to make it worse. We all know you're coming with nothing in hand. You're not ready to move. You know, you're going to wait you know, for another week or two. But look at democracy itself. Where is the administration when it comes to Egypt? Where is it when it comes to a number of governments? The fact is we accept as a reality of politics, that it is in our national interest to go with the bastards that at least we feel we can trust, as it were. And until we start figuring out a short and long-term policy that deals with, okay, who do we deal with now, but how do we somehow move things along so that there is a development of civil society, rule of law, the kind of culture, if you will, uh, of, of democracy in these countries, where are we going to be? Uh, you pick up The Economist now, you see yet another story about how Mr. Mubarak's son may still be being groomed to be a successor. That reality is out there, uh, and not just, not just in Egypt. Uh, America, yes, please, no, please. Uh, I hope you all didn't hear that, I'm getting chest pain. Um, uh, um, uh, and Bush three. Uh, America will have to be far more creative in responding. Both Blair and Bush promised massive economic and educational aid several years ago. We have not delivered that, and we have to start thinking about how we're going to deliver that in countries like Iraq and Afghanistan, and I think the world community has to think about that in terms of uh, areas in the Arab and Muslim world, significant economic and educational aid. We need to promote, then, real self-determination, not American-stamped democracy. Take a look at the, uh, the recent issue of The Economist. There's a great statement about the failure, as it were, of democratization, not only because of the regimes. The regimes know that they've got free space. I mean, there's no doubt about it, whether it's Ben Ali, whether it's Mubarak, whether it's Musharraf, whether it's, I have to be careful, I'm still amazed I get visas to some countries. Um, 
if we really want to distinguish, make, make a distinction with regard to dealing with Islam, then we have to do what Mr. Jeragian under the first President Bush, Mr. Pelletro under Clinton advocated and we never followed up on. Distinguish between Islamists that are moderate and radical. Both those administrations made that distinction and yet any time you would ask those assistant secretaries publicly to name a moderate group, they never would. They'd always say, oh, there are many of them out there because they knew it was dynamite to raise that issue and it still is. I think one of the most uh, happiest emails I ever received recently was after Hamas won and Martin uh, Kramer went on a tirade and basically uh, said that Bush and I were in the same bed together, which I thought was absolutely amazing. President Bush and I were in the same bed because we were responsible for Hamas being elected. It was absolutely uh, an amazing situation. And, but we have to learn to distinguish between moderate and extremist and in our policies with other, Muslim, uh, with other governments in the region to deal with that. Otherwise, we run the risk of what's happened after 9-11. Many governments, in the name of fighting domestic terrorists, control or shut down the system to any and all opposition, let alone Islamist oppositions. Just two more comments in conclusion. We can no longer function, uh, to afford to function with a double standard. Diplomacy, not threats of military action, have to be adapted when we deal with Iran and Syria if we're going to deal diplomatically with Korea. Unless we're willing to do that, that's an issue. Um, I don't know how you feel, but there are many people in Washington who take very seriously and believe that there will be a military strike before Mr. Bush uh, leaves office in terms of Iran. That kind of activity would be disastrous. Um, not, not figuring out ways to, to deal with Assad in Syria you know, more productively um, and, and to deal diplomatically and to talk to the other. I mean, these things are all very basic. So I end on this dismal note. As far as I can see, when I look at the last, only God knows how many years, but certainly the last four to eight years, to have these kinds of conferences we, where we talk about what is it that the U.S. needs to do or what we should do actually is a kind of waste of time because I don't see the fundamental issues that keep coming up all the time really being addressed. And these are issues of broader political participation and democratization, issues of Israel and Palestine, issues of how we view Islam in the Muslim world, the issue of learning to distinguish between the root causes of terrorism, which are more often than not political grievances like occupation, power, uh, uh, and powerlessness, and, and seeing religion as the way in which one frames and legitimates, but not the primary cause. You know, if I hear one more person say, as I've heard in some fairly sophisticated environments, Wahhabi, not that there isn't a Wahhabi problem. Now, the new thing is, you see, you don't want to keep saying the same thing if you're a young consultant, so then you get into neo-Salafi, not even Salafi. It's got to be neo-Salafi. Or in a recent meeting, and I'll end on this, this was a closed meeting of senior military, very senior military, with about eight people who were considered to be top experts, about 12. Four of them certainly weren't. Uh, and one of them made this prescient comment, absolutely prescient comment. It's not the first time I've heard this. Caliphate. That's the word, caliphate. And so everybody looked up, and the person said, what most people don't realize is that all Muslims, whether they are secular or religious, non-practicing or not, you play the card of the caliphate, and even if they're secular non-believers, it moves them. I leave you with that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, thank you, John. Maybe in the question period, he'll give us some good news. Um, <laughs> Ambassador Kofer Black, please. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I better start out first. I've learned that the best thing to do is to respond to what you're thinking, which is, yes, my name really is Kofer Black. It's not a pseudonym. It's not an alias. <laughs> Kofer is my mother's maiden name. That's how I got it. And I am stuck with it. And so now you can move on to thinking about other things. How did you ever get that name? <laughs> I'm kind of like the uncola here. I'm not an academic. I'm not writing a book. haven't read a book. And I don't plan to write a book. <laughs> um, 
I am looking forward to get back to uh, McLean, Virginia, where I'm vice chairman of a private security company, which is not as scary as hanging around with all you people up here. <laughs> <clears throat> um, I have written some notes on the back of a shirt cardboard to uh, try and come up with something that may be um, of use to you for you to consider. In terms of policy, I think counterterrorism policy, I think has been reasonably consistent. But listening to some of the other presentations, I'd like to share with you perhaps some of that and how did we get here part, which um, now I don't <clears throat> claim any sort of insider clairvoyance. All I can say is that I was sort of there at the time. I didn't take any notes, but this is what I remember. Um, and I did not volunteer to do counterterrorism. I had sort of other plans and in intelligence, and I sort of found myself in it, and then I found myself in it for quite a long time. So I was sort of an unwilling traveler. I've been doing this for quite a while. Um, the enthusiasm and the concern that you all have is admirable. Like I could say is, where were you when I needed you? Um, yeah. I've been, I've been there. You know, it's like a, I don't know, divorce. I've never been divorced. And I've been there, and uh, you're now going to the marriage counselor. Um, what I would like you to consider is the kind of, if you want, the pre-9/11 phase and the post-9/11 phase, and some things about the pre-9/11 phase. And these, I believe. Essentially, if you want to talk about policy and what we were doing, we believe that terrorism was essentially advanced by state sponsors. You remember those, uh, the Iraq of old, the Iranians, the Syrians, the Libyans, uh, Sudan, and I believe we threw in Cuba and North Korea. Most of the bad things would come from there. My early work with terrorism was sort of as a, at the Euro lefties, you know, the RAF, the Meinhof, and all of that. And that's what was sort of considered as terrorism. The uh, FBI, you join the FBI because you want to catch Al Capone, the FBI viewed terrorism as a criminal law enforcement activity. Uh, the CIA liked to collect foreign intelligence. The State Department wanted to negotiate things like NBFR and the SALT treaties. And my favorite one, and I was always shy about saying this, but since the chairman of Joint Chiefs, General Myers, said this actually in a committee meeting after 9-11, DOD doesn't do counterterrorism before 9-11. They're warriors, and their mission is to preserve the force, to close with, engage, and destroy the enemy. They don't do counterterrorism, concerned about things like posse comitatus. That's not their job. Before 9-11, if you went around the world, you might get sort of, and primarily here I'm referring to Al-Qaeda since you all have talked mostly about that, um, and being sort of a traveler in this mission, uh, it, uh, oh, it surprises me. Um, the, uh, the position of some of our allies overseas um, regarding the terrorist threat in Al-Qaeda, because before 9-11, having traveled the world with a lamp talking to heads of foreign intelligence services. There may be an exception, but you know what? I definitely had the sense that this was viewed as some sort of scam, you know? And in fact, I had one fellow say essentially that, you know, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, you CIA guys are coming up with this new gig for funding. Now that's where we were. Um, before 9-11, the only real defense in the policy sense um, against uh, al-Qaeda was basically uh, a group basically the size of an infantry company that had enough money every year for two modern jet fighter aircraft covering the world and various, um, various aspects of the terrorist threat. In the Middle East, you would go to them. I'm talking to senior people here. I'm saying, hey, look, really concerned about this or what? a lot of um, leads and problem areas coming through the Middle East. And they were the variations, but essentially the translation would be, um, you know, we've got this thing under control. We know our, we know our issue and we know our country. Uh, in Asia, there was a lack of appreciation that, that there were associations between their domestic terrorist groups, links and contacts, and 
um, the training facilities uh, in Pakistan. Um, the highlight of the period was sort of the millennium threat, I think, where the, where, you know, the government really did come together. Um, you had some examples of Rassam and the USS Cole and the like. I think that that was insufficient to really change our policy towards the issue. Um, <clears throat> people uh, who are analysts in terrorism and who write uh, uh, articles were describing, and this was very helpful, were describing the terrorist threat at the time before 9-11, one week or two weeks before 9-11. As you know, you have, it's a higher risk of being killed by a bee sting than you would a terrorist. Other articles were saying that, hey, um, really, this thing is quite overblown, and we should really be a bit more mature about the terrorist threat. There's a point to this in the end, when you try and make sense of everything that people have said. 9-11, um, with that, essentially, um, the issue went from lack of comprehensive sustained attention and allocation of resources <clears throat> to we've got 3,000 dead people. And um, whereas there are other issues that can affect us, such as you know avian flu and um, road fatalities and the like, the American people and their elected officials reacted to it dramatically and instantaneously. And as the director of counterterrorism, I went from no money, essentially, and limited capability to, you should have been there because it was way cool. How many people, how much money, and, um, and off we went. We probably made more progress in the classical terrorist sense in three or four months than we'd had in, about the, in previous five to 10 years. Um, the uh, Afghan situation was one that was basically that um, you hear a lot of things, but I'd like to leave you with this thought, that basically about, according to Bob Woodward, 400 people supported by calling in airstrikes um, liberated a country. And by from September 11th to the first week in December, all the major cities were liberated. We, they were criticized for, you know, paying people money. I'd rather pay people money than the U.S. government have to kill them. The collateral losses were very minimal. Um, it was probably one of the most cost-effective, cheapest, um, effective actions that this country has taken. It was a bargain. It went well. There are aspects of that afterwards that um, had some, some reasons of being unfortunate, but that was, um, that was, I think, well done, and I think reflected very well on, on, the, on the victims. I've given a couple of speeches at the National War College, uh, first one, I guess, about four years ago, and last one about two years ago. And like many of the speakers, <clears throat> I have um, the greatest admiration for the United States military. And for conventional war and nuclear war, they're the ones you want to go to. If you want to talk to wheel-to-wheel -wheel artillery, United States military, you can't beat it. Um, but what I would say to them is something that I would say to you, which is example to the Navy guys, I would say, you know, does Al-Qaeda or terrorists really care what the crush depth of a Los Angeles-class submarine is? No, it's irrelevant. The Army guys love that. And I'll say to the Army people, well, you know, what's the utility of a mechanized infantry brigade in counterterrorism? They start shuffling in their seats. I said, well, I'll tell you. Zero. Because the greatest fighting force known to man just isn't the right tool to the efficient and effective conduct of counterterrorism. I'm saying this for years. Maybe people come around to believe it. Some of the speakers have said public diplomacy. You know, you just think I'm going to go soft on you here. Well, I am because it works, you know. You need a very effective intelligence organization backed up by policy that enhances their mission, that allows us to build the will and capacity of our friends overseas so they can protect themselves. You know, just like the FBI going to Iowa, you know, the Americans going to Sri Lanka or the Philippines, you're never going to be as good. All, the best you can do is provide them with connections, threats that come into their country, help them with um, the capacity so they can defend themselves. If they can defend themselves, then they can help to defend you as most of my career. I probably spent more time saving foreign nationals' lives from terrorists than I have American. And you'll find that people in this line of work uh, have a real common theme of 
looking to protect the innocent from killers. Now you can come up with various justifications of you know it's you know it's a bad world and uh, you know they've had it pretty rough. But essentially, the defense of the innocent I think is always a noble and a good thing to do. Those of you that are students, I ask you to consider um, a life of service in whatever form that may take. It makes life um, all the more worthwhile. Um, when you talk counterterrorism, the counterterrorism policy, really what you're talking about, and I've heard this before, I just want to underscore it, is weapons of mass destruction. Um, you know, before 9-11, having a bomb go off at the odd embassy, getting a Navy ship hold here and there, it's kind of the cost of doing business. You know, if you're the, described as the world's only superpower, these are the things that can happen to you. But um, weapons of mass destruction, either actual or effectively portrayed in the media, um, would be extremely um, um, effective um, against the American people and our government. Uh, you can, those of you that live in Washington and go there, you see a sniper and what they do, you know, a couple of guys with a rifle put the whole city in panic. You can see what uh, enhanced radiation weapons would do um, and the like. I'm going to leave Iraq aside, since I'm not an expert in that. We can get that a little bit later. One of the most important things in counterterrorism policy is working with your friends overseas. Mm -hmm. Having been a clandestine operator for the CIA, you know, even if you can do it, it's very expensive, very hard, takes lots of people. Wouldn't it be easier if you have to follow a terrorist in Abuja, Nigeria, to do it with, with like real honest to goodness Nigerians, you know, rather than, you know, a guy from Kansas with the blue eyes and blonde hair? It's cost effective and it works. And that's the solution, I think, for the future. So working with friends and developing an intelligence baseline, you got to know what you're talking about. To counter the terrorists, you actually have to have information. That information has to be collected. And here's the worst part for you. <clears throat> Life is tough. Wear a helmet, you know? If you don't think bad things are going to happen, you need an adult guardian, <laughs> OK? <clears throat> on the way here, I have a very good friend who's in a senior position in a casino in Las Vegas. And I tried to call him before coming here because I had this great idea on the plane. Wouldn't it be like way cool to give you the odds of, you know, with these, with these people at the casinos? You know, they bet on everything out there. What are the odds that we'll get struck? Hmm? What are the odds? Um, well, he said, we'll have to work on that. Are they going to put money on it? I don't know. It's tough. They're students. Probably not much. Just, okay, we'll, we'll get to you later. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that um, the, um, this can be exacerbated by the shift. You've heard this before from other speakers. The shift from the big dramatic target, which, which generally there's, there is a continued fixation, over time to the small uh, target with less trained people. That's something that um, um, could very well happen and um, you, uh, you would be affected by it. The message of what, who we are and what we put out is very important. What we do and how we're perceived is very important. I've never met anybody overseas that begrudged Americans defending themselves. That's not the point. The point is that we need to remember that we have friends overseas and that we have to communicate equitably and we have to work hard to try and restore the type of relationship that we enjoyed in the past. There's a, there's a newspaper article, and I think one of your articles today, that said, um, today, which follows on the statistics, you know, the disapproval of the way the United States handled the Iraq was, was strikingly strong at 73%, okay? But I don't know of a time uh, when the United States was evaluated at a very high percentage around the world. Um, what, when I, um, in 2004, the Pew poll, you know, in, uh, in uh, Indonesia was catastrophically bad about how the United States was perceived. We do have to work on that. We do have to remember that, you know, it's still a poll. How you phrase the question is very important. But we are in a patch where we need everybody to pull together um, to move this along. I would like to leave you with an image, and I've heard this before. I thought I was the originator of it, but you've heard versions of this. Essentially, the problem is, through intent and capability, we have a Super Bowl-quality NFL football team. 300-pound guys, run the 40 and 
they bench press 550 pounds. We've got a lot of them, and they're good. And the door opens in the gym, and they go outside, and the problem is it's water polo. And they're going against the guys who are 100, I mean, little guys, 130, 140 pounds, wearing goofy hats, and swim like fish, and they're throwing a ball, and that's how they keep score. <clears throat> we got 300 million people. It generally will be okay. It will be a rough ride. We need to make some fundamental changes. The Iraq business has got to be corrected, and I leave that to people far smarter than me, but um, we need to learn those lessons, apply them to other places. Uh, there will be losses. We need to steel ourselves to it. We have to communicate with our friends overseas, and um, you have to believe in yourselves and that this will be uh, a better place. The issue of the, they've been brought up like Israel and Palestine. Yep. You know, I can remember in graduate school at Southern Cal, I never get this student from Libya in the class, Middle Eastern studies, got up in the chair, tears are coming down his face talking about the injustice of the Palestinian situation, which I agree. And when I travel in the Middle East and I see some pretty senior people, I always bring up this story. And he said, well, now his son's crying. Yes. You go to the Israeli side, it's bad all the way around. Israeli mothers crying because their fathers were in the war, their husbands in the war, their kids going to be in the war. You know, this is the point where we all need to pull together. It ain't easy. If it was easy, it would have been done. Okay? So we need to work collectively across the board. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Black. Uh, now we'll hear from uh, Mr. Rami Khouri. Sure. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, if I may, I'm going to speak from here. Um, like everybody else, I want to thank Leila and, uh, and Tufts uh, for doing this. I'm, uh, all of us, uh, many of us, um, see Leila as a, as a friend and a uh, a mentor and colleague, I'm the only one in this room who can call her partner because only she and I in the entire world run Isam Faris Institute. So um, <laughs> that's a special, uh, special honor that uh, I've recently had and uh, it gives me a lot to, uh, to emulate and to learn from. So <coughs> we hope to work together in the future. Um, I, uh, I have uh, uh, being, I think I'm the only person here who actually um, is an Arab who lives in the Arab world. I think there's many other Arabs here who live in Europe and the U.S. and other places. Uh, so coming from the Arab world, being a good Greek Orthodox Christian from Nazareth, it is my job to give you the sentiments of the Muslim people and the Arab people and, <laughs> and the other people all over the Arab world. And what I would like to do is give you a view from the region, a, a kind of a, 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 a public opinion view, the, the sort of the general sentiments uh, uh, in, in the region. Um, and I, I would like to just disagree with one thing that Koffer Black said, and uh, I, th I value his analysis, but I, I would actually like to say that it actually is easy if people have the courage and the honesty to deal with the issues as they really are. It is, it is not a complicated uh, issue in the, in the Middle East, uh, but I think uh, it becomes very uneasy when you're dealing with it from the perspective, say, of the White House then it becomes very complicated because of the various political and geostrategic and other pressures you have to deal with. But I think if we look at it as an abstract issue, it is actually quite easy. It's quite simple. It's quite straightforward. What we need is the honest, courageous leadership in the United States, in Israel, in the Arab countries simultaneously uh, to be honest, to be courageous, to be uh, decisive, and to, uh, and to uh, beat down the special interests uh, and to address the majorities of normal, average, decent, fair, compassionate, and justice-loving people in the U.S., in Israel, and in the Arab countries who do agree on how we can solve this problem, the Arab-Israeli conflict, it, quite easily, quite quickly, uh, if we had the will and the courage to do so. So I think that there, there is a different perspective, um, and I think this is one of our challenges, is to w actually work together on this. Uh, it's easy to disagree and criticize each other, and give our own perspectives, but I think the real challenge is how do we sit down together and figure out, learn from the mistakes of the past and the ina inadequacies of the past and move forward uh, to the futures. Um, and I will try to give you some suggestions based on uh, my own analysis of really what's going on in the region, and most importantly, well, what are the implications uh, of, 
uh, uh, for U.S. foreign policy in terms of the war on terror. And, and, and I think we understand what are the implications for U.S. policy when we analyze what are the consequences of U.S. policy or consequences of U.S. and everybody else's policies uh, in the region. And the war on terror uh, came in a context of uh, there was first the end of the Cold War, uh, and that opened up the Middle East, and you had a lot of identities and movements and things that started to emerge because the end of the Cold War took off this lid that had kept the region pretty much frozen. Um, and then you had uh, various um, events happening in the region, uh, like the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait and other things, or the rise of political Islam movements, um, and then the terror attack against the U.S., a lot of other terror attacks uh, in the region, and then the response of the American-led the global war on terror. And this has led us really to a whole new era. And I think if we look back on the last, say, not just the last five years since 9-11, but really the last uh, 15 years since the end of the Cold War, plus the last five years of the global war on terror, I think we can define a series of new and significant trends. And I would uh, like to mention 12 of them. Um, so I have, I think, 12 minutes left, so I'll do them, each one in one minute if I can. I think the first important trend is that there are many conflicts in the region today in an area that had been for many, many decades defined primarily by one conflict, the Arab-Israeli conflict, with the overlying Cold War and the little sub-conflicts that came with it. But today there are many conflicts, uh, Iraq, uh, Sudan, uh, Somalia, Lebanon, um, uh, Palestine, all over the region you find a range of different, and then tensions, the, the democratization issue, weapons of mass destruction, terrorism, um, all, there's a lot of different issues that are causes of tension among people. But the most significant thing is not that there are many conflicts now, but that they're also linked. They're linked in the perceptions of the people of the region. So if the United States or Great Britain or France comes to us and says, we want to promote democracy in Lebanon, and we want to pressure the Syrians, or we want to promote freedom in Iraq, we want to get uh, change the Iraqi government, we immediately, many people in the region say, well, what about Palestine? What about the UN resolutions on the Golan? What about Sudan? What about w other areas? Uh, um, why, don't, why are you not being consistent? So the linkage among these many con uh, conflicts provides a unified uh, spectrum or a unified uh, um, um, lens through which the average person in the region sees and judges other people who come from outside the region in terms of the consistency and, I would say, legality and morality and legitimacy of their uh, behavior. And there's operational linkages now. One of the reasons I'm sure, I don't have any inside information, but I'm prepared to bet a double falafel with hot sauce that one of the reasons that those guys firing Qassam rockets uh, from Gaza into Israel is the Israelis, with all of their power and all of the American technical and intelligence support that also supports them, could not stop the Qassam rockets, which are little more than large firecrackers made in people's basements. And the Israeli army could not stop them because, obviously, the Qassam rocket fires have learned from the Hezbollah guys how to protect your launchers. It's very clear. It's very obvious. There's no, there's no, you don't have to be a genius to figure it out. So there's operational linkages now among these many groups uh, in the region. Point number two, the global war on terror has brought us into a situation following the terror against the people of the region and the terror against the U.S., the response with the global war on terror has given us now a cycle, in, a chronic cycle, in which the three most significant parties in the cycle all use violence as a legitimate routine uh, and, and perhaps preferred means of expression. The three parties being the Arab states in the region and Iran, all the states in the region and Israel, the opposition to those states domestically, whether they're um, local oppositions or terror groups or whatever, and the foreign armies in the region, mainly the American and the British and, and occasional others. So the Arab states, Israel, Iran, the Americans, everybody now routinely uses uh, violence, and many of them use as uh, violence that we can probably call terror, routinely, as a chronic, normal means of political expression. The, 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 the legitimization of violence and occasional acts of terror by all the parties in the region is one of the most frightening um, uh, developments of the last three or four years, which has been capped by the global war on terror. It wasn't created by the global war on terror, but that provided the cap to it. Um, and the militias are one of the great growth sectors in the Middle East uh, today. There are militias cropping up everywhere, um, and this is one of the new, um, again, spreading uh, phenomena all over the Middle East. Point number three 
uh, related to that is that we're seeing the expansion of non-state actors and sub-state identities. Uh, as state power is fraying and uh, becoming more limited in its scope, you still have very powerful states who have a lot of resources, arms, money, soldiers, uh, bureaucracies, etc. They have a lot of power, but many states are fraying. Their, their power and their impact is getting less and less. It's fraying at the edges. There are many areas in many Arab countries where the state simply has no impact. It, sometimes it's afraid even to go. There has no presence. Uh, urban centers and rural uh, centers. And there are many people in the Arab countries who used to confront and challenge the state. For instance, the Islamists in Egypt, for instance, or some of the Islamists in Syria. Many people who used to challenge the state directly, often militarily, uh, they were beaten very badly. Uh, and they gave up on that. And the new phenomenon of the last, I would say, uh, 10, 15 years is that large segments of people in the Arab countries are simply ignoring their state. They're not even bothering challenging it anymore. They're getting on with their activism at the local level, social level, and in some cases, like Hezbollah and others, their military organization, or Hamas and others' military uh, organization. Um, and the, the uh, four elements of state power that I think uh, are the key elements of power in any society, the means that states use to control society, um, I would call those the economy, the military, the guns and police, information, meaning education and the mass media, and the uh, iconography of identity, the symbolism of identity, uh, flags, uh, religious symbols, uh, patriotic songs, historical memory, tribal uh, issues, the, the things that make your heart flutter and make you uh, patriotic and active and fight for your country and your people and your tribe and your land, the symbols of iconography, uh, information, uh, the, the military and economy, all four of those are now no longer a monopoly of state power as they used to be in the 50s and 60s and 70s. You have now military power all over the region in the hands of militias and armed groups and resistance groups and private groups and gangs and criminal groups, some of which are supported by the United States and England and Europe, others which are, are homegrown. You have media power, of course, decentralized completely with the satellites and Internet. You have economic power with globalization, commercialization, um, and privatization gradually going out of the hands uh, of the state, and the symbols of identity have long been uh, diffused now. You have so many other religious groups, tribal groups, ideological groups who are taking the place uh, of the state. The implications for this are not just that state power is fraying, and I use the word fraying because it's still strong. These are not states that are collapsing, but these are states whose power is becoming more limited. The implications are that the fraying of state power, I think, may bring us to a point soon where the configurations of statehood may also be recon re reconsidered, the physical borders of states. Uh, Iraq is a, ca is a candidate. Lebanon may be a candidate. Sudan is a candidate. Somalia already split up. Uh, there are potentially five or six Arab countries that may be reconfigured uh, soon. Point number four is that you have an extraordinary phenomenon in the Arab world that I don't know has existed anywhere else. I'm not a historian, but uh, you have the phenomenon of individual sovereign countries with essentially two competing simultaneous governments. Lebanon has, essentially has two governments. Palestine formally legally has two elected governments, Hamas and Abu Mazen, both legitimate, both elected, both uh, competing for uh, power. Somalia, uh, Sudan, uh, Iraq has probably several governments. Uh, this is a new phenomenon of single statehood and multiple governments, and it's one of the great Arab contributions to human civilization. <laughs> and I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but we'll have to see how it develops. Point number five is that the, one of the reasons for these developments is the aggressive uh, um, um, military uh, intrusive nature of the intervention of Western powers in the last few years, predominantly the United States, but not only the United States, because the Europeans have done this in their typically more soft fashion with the Barcelona process and the British with their little bit more arrogant fashion as they have done in the Middle East for years with their army. But the, the intrusive nature of Western intervention, which is not the traditional Western intervention which used to protect legitimate national interests such as trade routes, um, uh, allies, uh, friendly states, uh, Israel, other interests that the West used to point out as its legitimate things that it wanted to protect. But now the, the West is intervening, saying it wants to change our, they want a more moderate Islam, they want a better education system, better human rights, more governance, more a role for women. Uh, they want to change the whole values and systems, the software of our societies. And whether, even though these are probably goals that we would mostly agree are probably reasonable goals, I mean, we we all want better 
societies, more democracy, more equality, more justice for everybody, less extremism, less violence. All of us agree on those goals, uh, but I don't think using the American and British Marines is the way to do it. Uh, and that intrusive, aggressive nature uh, of Western intervention brings me to point number six, which is that this has generated a, I think around the region today, the most significant recent development uh, that we see in public opinion, and also among some governments, is that these elements I mentioned before have generated a kind of a fearless uh, defiance and resistance. Uh, and this is the end of docility. The word docility was used earlier uh, about uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, I've used the term the end of docility in, in the Arab world, uh, that no longer, uh, f four generations after Sykes-Picot, uh, finally, masses of people in the Arab world, ordinary people, simply will not put up with this kind of intrusive, aggressive, predatory, um, and um, uh, 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 manipulative Western intervention in, and uh, dominance by regimes in the Arab world. They will, will not put up with this kind of uh, life anymore, and they are resisting, they are rebelling, uh, they are fighting back in, in any possible uh, way that they can, and they're fighting back, but they're basically against three targets, their own Arab regimes, first and foremost, the impact of Israel and its policy, second, and the Western armies and political um, ideologies, third. Um, and what you're seeing is the tradition of modern weakness, vulnerability, marginalization, and fear that, has do that have dominated the last generation and a half of Arabs, or two generations since the 1960s, perhaps, until now, where most Arabs have been docile and fearful and feeling helpless. And that this has become translated, finally, into a combination of self-assertion and then active resistance. In some cases, even military resistance, including fighting against Israel, as we've seen recently in Palestine and Lebanon, and when possible, some people are fighting against the United States and Iraq. If they're not fighting directly, they're emotionally supporting the people who are fighting, the legitimate resistance fighters uh, in Iraq. And in this sense, the U.S. war, the war on terror, the American military move into Iraq was transformative in the eyes of Arab public opinion in the same way that the American military presence in Saudi Arabia sparked the uh, birth of al-Qaeda to fight the United States. I think it's that important. The move into Iraq uh, spurred a very widespread sense of uh, anger and then uh, a resistance against the U.S. Uh, after the U.S. Uh, went into uh, Iraq. And the, the global war on terror in this respect, in fact, heightens, uh, expands, and perpetuates uh, all of the trends that have aggravated Arabs for the last three or four uh, generations, which is Western armies coming into the region doing whatever they want, uh, Western powers, Arab powers essentially ignoring the Palestine problem and not really doing much about it, um, Western countries supporting Arab autocratic regime in the name of higher goals of security and national interest, uh, ignoring public opinion sentiments throughout the Arab world, and now with the new element, uh, post-9-11, which is the demonization of Islam. And I think the combination of the demon, widespread demonization of Islam, when the American president keeps talking of Islam and fascism uh, uh, regularly, routinely, all the time, and you get this on Fox TV and CNN and spread all over the, uh, the mediocre media, or the mainstream media, because there's some very good media in the U.S., but the combination of the political leadership and the mass media together uh, making a frontal assault on Islam leads to a situation now where three out of four Muslims in the Arab world feel that the United States wants to dominate and weaken Islam. Islam. This is a very powerful sentiment all over, all, all over the region. So the, 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 G, the global war on terror has, in fact, perpetuated and heightened all of the bad things that Arabs have sensed they've been getting from the West for the last three generations and added a new powerful dimension, which is uh, Islamophobia. Uh, point number seven is that the, the polarized societies in the region now, because of these and other trends, uh, we now can see broad outlines of a new confrontation. Maybe we can call it a new Cold War. That might be too uh, strong a term. Uh, but certainly a new global confrontation that is uh, anchored in the Middle East. Um, and it's fought, unlike the Cold War, it has ideological battles, political battles, military battles, cultural battles, political battles and all different military battles in all different areas, uh, with local players acting as proxies for uh, regional forces. Um, and what you see uh, going on today, uh, in Lebanon you see it, in Palestine, in Somalia, and other places, you see Western powers and Arab powers actively, and Israel in some cases, actively backing some 
parties in the Arab world, like, for instance, the Senora government in Lebanon, the uh, Abbas, uh, Mahmoud Abbas government in Palestine, actively backed by these Western forces and Arab and Israeli forces, <coughs> against the other group of parties in this co global confrontation, which is uh, Hamas, Hezbollah, Muslim Brothers, some of the democratic forces, Arab nationalist forces, the Syrian government, the Iranian government, a very strange combination uh, of uh, people who had traditionally fought each other, but now are in this loose alliance. And we saw this, point number eight, is that we saw this in Lebanon this summer. It was very powerful to see the enormous support that Hezbollah had, uh, as well as the capabilities that Hezbollah had to fight against uh, Israel. Um, is, Israel was supported very powerfully by the Israeli people. Uh, some Arab governments and many Arab people, not many, but some Arab people wanted Israel to beat up Hezbollah, but they could, didn't say so publicly, though that some of them blamed Hezbollah. But the, the United States clearly and some Europeans gave uh, uh, Israel green light and ammunition or whatever, fuel, whatever they needed to get the job done. And Hezbollah fought back very uh, ably um, for 34 days. Um, and part of the reason for this, I think it did so, is that uh, it had tremendous support around the Arab world and much of the uh, Arab Asian world. Arab Asian world. I don't like to speak of the Islamic world, but the Arab Asian uh, region. And I think that one of the reasons for this is that Hezbollah, if you look at why the people were supporting them, they really reflected seven powerful uh, sentiments that are very prominent uh, in this region. That Hezbollah represented the assertion of Islamic values and politics. It represented a self-assertion of a Shiite identity, which has been going on in Lebanon since the early 70s, but also in other places. It asserted a, a will to resist Israeli occupation and to fight Israel capably. It, it reflected the determination to help the Palestinians and to keep speaking about the Palestinian cause, to promote pan-Arab sentiments. Much of the rhetoric of Nasrallah now is very pan-Arabist. sounds like Nasser sometimes when you hear him. Uh, it reflected an anti-American uh, struggle. They, he talks now of, of, of fighting American hegemony. The, reason, the main reason he fights the Senora government now is to stop American control, as he says it. Uh, and they rep represent a desire, which they've done in, in, in some cases on the ground, to promote better, more efficient, non-corrupt uh, government. Seven powerful reasons which resonate widely across the region. Uh, and that is what, and then of course they also provide a lot of good social services and things on the ground. So you've got a, lo a lot of powerful reasons why the Hezbollah message resonates so powerfully among uh, so many people. And in response, you had a few days ago in Paris, the U.S. and the Arabs and the Western world giving uh, Fouad Senora seven billion dollars for support of the Lebanese government. So this war, this confrontation between these two forces is very clear and it's expanding and I think it's the dominant one in the region now. And the most uh, more important recent, recent development in that now is the fact that the uh, many of the Arab uh, uh, power elites and governments with Western support, Arab government support, Israeli support quietly, are fighting back against the Islamists. This is the really fascinating new, uh, the, uh, new uh, dynamic that we see in the region, people fighting back against the Islamists. And that's why Hezbollah in Lebanon today in the last week has been caught a little bit sort of off guard. They're not sure how to deal with this. They've never had this uh, phenomenon. Hamas is dealing with it in, uh, in Palestine. And we have to see how this plays itself out. It's not clear how... Uh, how it's uh, it's going to uh, how it's going to develop. The point number nine is that Hezbollah has developed a uh, large following in the region as well, because uh, it has been able to transcend many of the barriers that used to keep people apart in the region. For instance, you have the Iranians helping. Uh, Hezbollah. You have the Syrian government helping Hezbollah. You have Hamas with the Iranian government Hezbollah. You have Sunnis and Shiites. You have Arabs and Persians. You have Ba'athist secular, so-called uh, allegedly Ba'athist secular regimes uh, helping Islamist uh, uh, regimes. You have an extraordinary combination of people working together who used to, who spent the last 30, 40 years fighting each other. And this represents potentially a major new power alignment uh, in, in the region. Point number 10, the consequence of a lot of this is that uh, we have essentially, that the American-led global war on terror essentially has negated the development of the promotion of democracy as a credible policy for the moment, but also has wiped out temporarily, I think, much of the uh, anchorage of American policy uh, throughout the region and weakens the United States, not just regionally but throughout the world, which you see in public opinion polls all over the world recently, one a few days ago for the BBC, showing how the U.S. is now feared around the world as a force for 
uh, as a dangerous force. Uh, point number 11 is that the Middle East strategic balance now, when the U.S. starts me leaving Iraq, which I think it probably will in the coming year or so, starts slowly getting out of Iraq, when you look at when Arab, ordinary Arabs look around the region and they look at what kind of strategic balances are going to be, they see basically four forces who will find the balance among themselves to define the strategic architecture and security architecture of the region. Those forces will be the United States, which will continue to be a major force in the region, Israel, uh, Turkey, uh, and Iran. And there's no Arabs in the Arab strategic security picture. It's an extraordinary situation where the Arabs have essentially, through their own incompetence and subservience to others, have written themselves out of their own security architecture. We even now have the Ethiopians and Somalia being part of the security architecture of the reason. This is not a stable and sustainable situation. You're not going to get 340 million Arabs sitting around for two more generations watching their region dominated by Israel, Turkey, Iran, the United States, and Ethiopia. So I think we have a, a huge... Uh, gap that has to be filled somehow. The only major force in the region is the Islamist political force, and that is not a cohesive single force. Each one is nationally anchored. So that's just an issue that's come up in recent years that we have to look at, but certainly it's a recipe for instability. And point number 12 is that as an antidote to all this, I think we have to ask ourselves, well, what do we do about the situation? Do we just sit around and, and watch this stuff and keep having conferences about it or writing books about it? Or, um, I'm, I'm actually not writing a book about it. The only reason I'm not writing a book about it is because I've always been terrified by footnotes. And every time I'm just I'm terrified by writing a book and then changing a footnote at the end and having to change all of them, even though I guess the computers help you do that now. It's a bit easier than it was before. So so maybe I'll overcome my uh, phobia. But the antidote to this is, what do we do about this? We have, we have these extraordinary trends that I've mentioned, all of them leading towards instability, violence, contestation of power, uh, fighting in the streets. We're seeing it now, Beirut, Somalia, uh, Palestine, Iraq. Uh, I think the antidote is that we, we need to develop a system of both statehood and governance that respond to the core and the enduring values, rights, and attributes that ordinary Arab people value, that ordinary American people and Israeli people and everybody else values. And I think there's five, sovereignty, identity, legitimacy, stability, and material human development. We need real sovereignty. We don't have real sovereign countries. We need countries that really have the power to govern themselves. And they have to have the ability to express their identity, both the individual identity of citizens and the collective identity of their national community. They need to be legitimate. The states need to be legitimate. Many of them are not. But some states start as illegitimate but become legitimate by giving power and uh, authority to their own people. But we need the le legitimacy of governments and states. And this leads to stability, which will lead to uh, material development. And I think if you look at the situation, you realize that Sovereignty, identity, legitimacy, stability, and development are, in fact, the five things that have been threatened and negated in the Arab world for ordinary Arabs by the global war on terror. And the Arab, ordinary Arab population is simply not sitting around like they used to and watching this stuff on TV or reading about it in reports by American and British and French think tanks anymore. That's what we used to do 20 years and 50 years ago. You have Middle East populations that are responding robustly to their own uh, marginalization, their own dehumanization, and the response is not pretty. Sometimes it's violent. Sometimes it's uh, disruptive. Uh, I think the best we can do now is simply see what's going on and recognize these forces honestly and courageously and then try to craft better policies. And I repeat, better policies by the Arab countries, by Israel, Europe, and the United States. This is not only an American problem. Uh, this is a collective problem, uh, and I think it has to be solved collectively. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rami. Now we'd like to hear from uh, Professor Shugata Bose, uh, who is our discussant for the evening for this panel. Well, it's a great delight to be back at Tufts, as always. And when uh, Leila invites you to a conference being organized by her, it is really an order to attend. So I have rushed back from India uh, just in time for uh, this, uh, this afternoon. 
And even though uh, I was uh, not present here with you in the morning, uh, my uh, participation in this conference began at about 3 a.m. Eastern time, perhaps even sooner, about 2.30 a.m., when I was checking my email in my hotel room uh, in uh, London. And I found a message from uh, someone who had heard about the conference. Uh, the news of this conference has spread far and wide. And I found a message actually addressed both to uh, Aisha and to me by a colleague who is a historian of Afghanistan, uh, who seemed to be calling into question the title of this conference, The War on Terrorism, and telling us that what's going on in the world today is not a war on terrorism at all. But he was not making the argument, as some do, and uh, something that John Esposito has referred to, he wasn't claiming that what's happening is a war on Islam. Uh, he put a far more sophisticated spin on contemporary events and suggested that there are imperial ambitions, uh, there are imperatives of nation states, there are anxieties of non-state actors which are clashing with one another. And we need to understand these very complex forces if we are to find a way out of the mess that we are in uh, today. Um, however, war on terrorism does have a certain reality as a rhetorical device. Uh, that is exactly how it has been defined in the United States of America. And since I have spent the last month or so in India, I am beginning to wonder whether it has been a very clever or appropriate rhetorical device as well uh, from the point of view of prosecuting such a war against some enemies who really have to be fought. I say this because um, terrorism is not quite the bad word that it is here in many other parts of the world. I was uh, going through school textbooks I was hearing popular folk songs. Uh, I was simply getting some insights into popular memory where terrorists seem to be lauded, uh, if not worshipped. And this is understandable in many parts of the world uh, that have been under colonial rule. Now, those who were branded terrorists, for example, by the British colonial power, would naturally prefer to be called freedom fighters or revolutionaries rather than terrorists. But if it came to it, they were also prepared to you know, wear the label terrorist as some kind of a badge of honor. And there were also quite um, sophisticated arguments put forward in defense of a resort to violence to answer violence on the part of those who were being branded terrorists. And exactly 100 years ago in 1907, a leader of uh, the anti-colonial movement in India, who was about to be charged with terrorist conspiracy, a charge that failed, however, had this to say. It is the common habit of established governments, and especially those which are themselves oppressors, to brand all violent methods in subject peoples and communities as criminal and wicked, and then went on to add the refusal to listen to, quote, the cant of the oppressor, attempting to lay a moral as well as a legal ban on any attempt to answer violence by violence had the approval of the general conscience of humanity, unquote. So this is the environment uh, in which, you know, uh, uh, the United States is attempting to wage what is being called a war on terror. And, um, and I wonder whether, in fact, uh, what the resistance groups who resort to, to tactics of terror have actually lost legitimacy, or whether, in fact, they are making just a very pragmatic calculation uh, that you know, certain kinds of suicide attacks just will not serve their purpose, particularly in a post-September 2001 environment. Uh, that um, it's really uh, a question of just as in the past various 
subject peoples had to decide on their strategy based on the circumstances of their servitude. Should we adopt passive resistance? Should we adopt revolutionary violence, etc.? So also, in the international arena, things have changed so dramatically that it seems to me that you know, Tamil Tigers or even you know, the, the rebels in Kashmir have realized that certain kinds of violent actions will actually make things far worse for them. Whether it's a wholesale loss of legitimacy is something that I wonder about. Now, we've heard three very interesting uh, presentations uh, by a, a pessimist, by someone who is a satirist, and finally someone who is actually quite an optimist, and that's in some way startling because he was the one giving the view from the region, a region that has been racked by, by violence and ought to be in the throes of despair. Um, now, John, of course, uh, in his inimitable style, provided us with a powerful indictment of the whole gamut of acts of omission and commission by the current uh, US uh, administration. And, uh, and it's clear what needs to be done, uh, um, and John sees very clearly, as many others do, that the Israel-Palestine nettle has to be grasped. Uh, but he is utterly pessimistic, and I tend to agree with him that uh, there doesn't seem to be uh, any political will or the requisite leadership to actually do exactly that. So far as the promotion of democracy is concerned, for John, it's been merely an exercise in hypocrisy. He has also told us that the radical moderate distinction is hugely exaggerated if one looks at actual attitudes as have been revealed in the surveys with which he has been involved. And that would lead us to uh, believe that a policy based on simply rallying the moderates may not be a panacea for the future. I just wondered as I was listening to John that given that you know, the radical moderate distinction seems to be in fact non-existent in many spheres, why is he continuing to use those categories? Uh, would it not be best to abandon that dichotomy altogether to get a better understanding of, uh, of uh, attitudes in the Islamic world and the Arab world. Gopher Black, of course, uh, brought in the, uh, the, the, the important distinction between state sponsors of terrorism and various non-state elements. 9-11 as a crucial turning point in terms of actual preparations to you know, combat what uh, is a real threat to the United States of America. I'm not sure, though, that I agree with his assessment of the Afghan war, especially in light of what he said immediately after he suggested that at least the Afghan war between October and December of 2001 had been a great success. He made a much larger point about the need of the United States to be able to communicate with its friends overseas. And the United States does have friends overseas, admirers overseas. And uh, looking back, it seems to me that in the aftermath of the absolutely ghastly 9-11 attacks, uh, and their terrorisms and terrorisms, their terrorisms that had, uh, target uh, you know, uh, military installations or personnel, and here was an absolutely inhuman attack on basically thousands and thousands of completely innocent civilians. And in the immediate aftermath of that attack, it seems to me that the United States for once had the sympathy of the whole world, excepting for a few diehard elements who you know, uh, had been indoctrinated in hatred. And that, that moment of the kind of invasion that took place against Afghanistan actually was the turning point which triggered a rather rapid loss of that sympathy and support that the United States had earned. So that is one reason that I'm calling into question somewhat the assessment of uh, the Afghan wars, at least that had gone well, that had gone right. And the other is, of course, that 
You know, it, this happened in 2001. And if by January 2007, Afghanistan, in fact, is a terrible situation, one wonders whether we, it's possible really to say that in that initial moment, things had gone right. Uh, we cannot make assessments based on such, you know, short-term, you know, trajectories. And uh, since, you know, Iraq is seen to be much more of a uh, catastrophe, I, I would just want to point out that at least for, for those of us who look at the world from something of a South Asian perspective, the Afghanistan situation, in fact, is quite alarming. And, uh, and therefore, we, uh, we, we would need to think much more carefully about it. Um, I think it was very good to have a, a view from the region and a voice uh, from the region, even though I must say that um, uh, once uh, Rami Huri uh, announced his optimism and then laid out what needed to be done, I found myself falling into the pessimistic camp with John Esposito when he suggested that it would, uh, we need courageous and honest leaders in the United States of America, Israel, and the Arab countries simultaneously. It did seem to me to be a rather tall order. Now, however, I think he has made a number of, you know, he identified his 12 trends with great lucidity and clarity. And I can see that they are not only multiplying conflicts in the Middle East, as a whole and beyond, but also that many of these conflicts are linked or connected. He, he, he really wanted to stress the linkages. And therefore, one has to ask whether in the United States there can be an underlying or a unified approach to these connected problems. However, I think that there are certain big problems which uh, probably need to be addressed and to be looked at in the context of this larger sort of uh, congeries of uh, you know, linked uh, challenges. And, uh, and these are the questions that I'll leave the, uh, the panel with. First of all, how does one tackle Al-Qaeda? Um, an enemy that has to be fought. And here again, I'm a bit pessimistic on the basis of what I've heard, because there's n not a very clear sense of, you know, what the Al-Qaeda is. And I can understand that, you know, it may be a bit of an organization and a bit of a social movement, and it is a very elusive and an amorphous enemy, extremely difficult to pin down. And that, of course, again, reinforces what I just said about Afghanistan. I mean, I would have considered Afghanistan between October to December 2001 a success if, in fact, the top brass of the Al-Qaeda had been got. And since it had not, I cannot actually give it the certificate of, of success. And how does one fight it? Does one continue the current policy of, you know, support to the Musharraf uh, administration? What is ac actually going on in Waziristan? What is the United States attitude to that question? And it would be very interesting to hear, particularly John, to say a few words about what he thinks um, the United States imagines is going on in Waziristan and uh, what the you know, likely sort of short-term future of that policy is going to be. The second big question that has to be dealt with is, in fact, policy towards Iran. And here, uh, it seems to me that, I mean, I hear two kinds of points of view that, I mean, there is a slight danger of Bush adventurism uh, in relation to Iran as well. On the other hand, I also hear cynics t t tell me, and cynics who actually understand American policymaking much better than I do, that Bush only fights weak enemies, Afghanistan or Iraq, which could be easily overwhelmed. Uh, but Iran would be a completely different kettle of fish, and therefore the United States even under President George W. Bush is going to be much more circumspect before launching any military aggression against Iran. But um, the United States faces quite major challenges in relation to Iran in terms of allies as well. You know, Europe is not likely to go along with a very aggressive policy. I mean, the only real major power that has supported the United States in Iraq was Blair's Britain. 
And uh, now that uh, there's going to be a transfer of power or leadership to Gordon Brown, I was reading in the papers, even as I was coming across the Atlantic, that Gordon Brown has already hinted in a speech that he gave yesterday that he's going to perhaps not pursue the special relationship in the way that uh, Blair uh, had. And if, even if you look at other strategic partners that, uh, that the United States believes it has in the broader region, India is now a strategic partner, and it has cast two helpful votes for the United States of America. But um, India is a country which would have to match its global ambitions, for which it needs good relations with the United States, with the imperatives of keeping its interregional relations in good repair, and will not you know, abandon what is a historic relationship with Iran. So under those circumstances, what does the United States do? And what might even a new administration in America do? And finally, uh, let me end with Iraq. And here it's not so much a question, even though I'd like to hear um, what the panelists have to say on this matter. Uh, but I have a view on, uh, on Iraq. And at the moment, uh, especially after the announcement of the uh, plan to boost troops, that has been the centerpiece of discussion and analysis. But it really seems to me that you know, the kind of political arrangement that is created in Iraq is of far greater relevance and long-term importance. And here I find that you know, for all the blunders that have been made by the Bush administration in Iraq, some of the ideas that I find coming from the democratic camp uh, particularly from you know, Biden and Galbraith and so on, I find extremely worrying. Particularly, you know, partitionist solutions that are being proposed on the basis of rather watertight categories of Sunnis, Shias, Kurds, and so forth. And here I think you know, a, a recourse to history is of great importance to look at the consequences of the partitions, whether of you know, Ireland or India, or even Palestine for that matter, even though it was a somewhat different case. And it seems to me that it is always better to divide sovereignty rather than to divide land. Because in whatever way, and that is the lesson, I think, of the Irish partition and the Indian partition, in whatever way you might divide up territory, you will leave vulnerable minorities of one sort or another in every piece of territory that you might want to carve out. And, uh, and so I, I really think that um, the, the, um, the, the long-term approach to you know, Iraq and how, you know, what to do there uh, would, uh, would be extremely important. And in my view, one of the things that ought to be done is to rule out partitionist solutions altogether. And for that, not only will public diplomacy be needed of the sort that uh, uh, John uh, Esposito advocates, but also I think educators have a role to try and educate what will hopefully be uh, the new democratic uh, leadership that will take the White House after having taken the Houses of Congress. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Bose. Uh, I want to open up the floor, but I think uh, Professor Bose has posed very important questions to our panelists, and I, I think we have to allow them just a, a brief moment to, uh, to, to respond before we go to the floor. Uh, yeah, John, do you want to start? Um, how to f fight or tackle um, al-Qaeda? Well, you've got the military side of it, but what I kind of remember is what um, General Shinseki said at a time when um, several of us were, he called several of us uh, before, um, uh, the, while the U.S. was in Afghanistan, and we were talking about a war against global terrorism, and Shinseki said very clearly that the military um, is equipped to fight capture and contain the enemy, but not to win a war against global terrorism. And just recently, in several meetings I've had with the, a variety of military, in CENTCOM, but also other places, it was amazing to me how many of the military in their own way were saying the same thing. 
Um, this contrasts, for example, with a government-generated uh, review of our public diplomacy program, um, which um, the study, the report came out about six months ago. Um, but I can say that in, in one conversation, I, I was part of the committee, um, uh, it, it was said by somebody, although the report did not go in that direction, but um, uh, one was almost, in, in fact, one was told the ground rules were, as we began our discussion, that there could be no criticism of American foreign policy. There could be no criticism of the Bush administration's policy. Uh, and some even said no discussion of root causes. Uh, and so, you know, in fact, somebody else was here who was on the panel, but he just sort of left. But, I mean, that was part of the reality, so I think that's a reality. With regard to what the U.S. is, with regard to Waziristan, uh, how many of you know the writing of Rudolf Otto? Good, that's great. Uh, if you're an old-style historian of religion, you would. Uh, Rudolf Otto talks about fear and trembling, um, uh, but he's talking about uh, God. And I would feel that in discussing, uh, answering that question in front of Aisha Jalal, I would only approach that with fear and trembling. So I would prefer to leave that to Aisha <laughs> at some point to comment on. What did I get out of that one? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd just make two comments on uh, both how to deal with al-Qaeda <coughs> and uh, what to do on Iran. I think the first thing we have to realize, it took us a long time to get to this difficult situation in the Middle East, the entire region. Uh, we're not going to get out of it easily. Uh, it's going to take years to get out of this uh, situation. The second thing is uh, we can, though, w run the reel backwards and see, I think, pretty clearly what brought us here. How did people like Hezbollah, Hamas, Muslim Brothers, leftist groups, Al-Qaeda, terror groups, other, these, all these new phenomena in the Middle East, some of them not so new, some of them going back to the 30s or 50s, but a lot of them are quite new. What are the reasons that gave birth to them? I think that's pretty well documented. Uh, we can identify the grievances uh, that uh, define and drive a lot of people's emotions and a lot of people's actions in the Arab world and the wider Middle East. And I think we need to define and address those grievances, uh, but to do them collectively, that, you know, in, in engaging with the Western world, not taking orders or submitting to threats, but just sitting down together and looking at issues of legitimacy, democracy, economic development, equity, etc. I think it can be done. Um, and the third way to do it is, the third point is, to look at other situations that, say, the Western world has dealt with, uh, communism, um, uh, uh, People's Republic of China, which you used to call Red China when you refused to talk to them uh, years ago, and you thought that was okay to delegitimize them, but it's not okay for the elected Arabs to delegitimize the Israeli government. So that kind of contradiction, I think, has to be gotten out of the way. We can't have hypocritical double standards. You've got to have a single standard applied to everybody. Um, and the way to do it is to look at the issue that you dealt with, say, at the Helsinki process, which I think was brilliant. Helsinki was a great um, a development. It helped eventually bring down the Soviet Union and let you win the Cold War. So to look at the combination of uh, sticks and carrots, uh, acknowledging other people's realities, as well as telling them what you don't like about them, uh, I think a combination of those things will ultimately lead to changes in governance and the conditions in the Middle East. And only those societies themselves will delegitimize and then get rid of al-Qaeda-type movements, in the same way that IRA terrorism has essentially stopped now in Northern Ireland, through that kind of patient political process. So I think it can be done, but again, it needs uh, better quality leaders and politicians. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Black, would you like yeah, to comment? Um, in Afghanistan, what I was trying to suggest in terms of success was <clears throat> you had a um, minimal amount of attention on these things, and then the United States responded very quickly uh, with tremendous resources. Yet in this case, I think it was very circumspect and did it with, in a pretty um, balanced-like way that I think was very efficient and effective. And uh, I think it is correct. It, it was... Um, in that sense, it was removing it, at least from at that time, as a terrorist sanctuary. It was a, it was a success. The, um, uh, the inability to catch uh, Osama bin Laden and the others, those of you who know the region can understand how that could be. But um, I think that the, this, the situation there, again, sort of t began to tend towards the heavy forces, which my point was really to argue that um, that for various reasons, is, as, a, as a general rule, is not a good way to go. 
Uh, you want to use, um, you know, f uh, liaison relationships, intelligence. You want to know what you're doing and uh, and put out a good public relations message. You want to deal through diplomacy. I just think the force structure is not not the most efficient way to do that. Um, but I do think initially going in, I, I do personally believe it was successful. Waziristan is sort of a new version of Afghanistan. <clears throat> Far away, they've established camps, lots of trainees in them. And, um, you know, those trainees are being trained for something, and they'll, they'll be a problem for somebody. Um, yet it is in a, located in a country for which we have very important relationships, uh, as well as they have nuclear weapons which presents some complications in terms of the flexibility and the, and the range of things that can be done. Um, we used to be in the same situation with Afghanistan. I can remember people talking about, you know, in the meetings about the various countries, neighboring countries and why nothing can be done. And again, the, my point is, is the reaction from perhaps too much in one direction, not enough, and then an overreaction too much on the other. What I'm trying to argue for is a bound, more, more effective, balanced, even, Handed approach to the uh, counterterrorism is identifying terrorists and stopping them from hurting innocent people. I believe it can be done. I think it has to be pretty nuanced. I also think, like Winston Churchill said, you know, the Americans eventually get it right after they try everything else. So, you know, it's not, you know, the end and there's nothing else. You know, we'll rebound like a ball, and uh, eventually the question is, hopefully, we'll do it sooner rather than later. We'll we will develop a way to do this more uh, efficiently and more effectively uh, for our own interests and the interests of, of our friends. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, we only have just a few minutes left before our uh, concluding uh, speaker at 6.15. If there are questions from the floor, we'll uh, entertain those. I think we have a microphone. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Partition had gone disastrously badly, and he said it. Said and, and he said it's better to divide sovereignty than land. I'd appreciate a couple of examples of successful division of sovereignty. You see, that's <coughs> precisely what has not been done during the period of the you know, post-colonial transition. Uh, perhaps um, I, it would be better to say that I was advocating a sharing of sovereignty, which could also be called a division of sovereignty. And um, I think uh, what, you, um, uh, what you have uh, in the world today uh, is um, uh, a scenario uh, where, in fact, Division or sharing of sovereignty is something that you have in pre-colonial times. All pre-colonial empires divided and shared sovereignty. You know, a sovereign was simply the, you know, the highest manifestation of sovereignty. There were many other sovereigns at different levels of the polity. In other words, you could have many sovereigns over any particular piece of land. And similarly, if you look at the most enlightened sort of history of uh, uh, anti-colonial political thought, you would also find that well into the early 20th century, you do have views in, uh, which suggest how, in fact, power can be shared by very diverse religious or linguistic uh, communities. Now, what happened, generally speaking, you know, post-Second World War, was that uh, large parts of Asia and Africa, which had long traditions of shared sovereignty, accepted the idea of monolithic sovereignty from the West. You know, it had already been coming in from the 19th century. If you wanted to, uh, uh, you know, get me to give a, an example of where it has perhaps worked or is beginning to work now, <clears throat> is that, you know, Britain, for example, which taught India and Indians and Pakistanis the notion of unitary sovereignty, has changed its mind. And it's now prepared to think in terms of at least, you know, partially dividing or sharing sovereignty. That I think, and this is something that my younger brother Shubantra, who is here somewhere, uh, wrote about. I mean, if you, if you look at the Good Friday Agreement of 1998, it could not have been forged 
uh, without, of course, um, you know, having some notion of being able to divide or share sovereignty. Uh, and it meant not just dividing uh, sovereignty between Britain and Ireland when it came to ar political arrangements in Northern Ireland, uh, but also layering sovereignty so that you know, Northern I Ireland itself got, uh, got a certain measure of sovereignty. And all this, of course, worked uh, you know, reasonably well, relatively speaking, because there's also the larger experiment of the European Union that is taking place, where, in fact, um, you know, even the, that rather clumsy word subsidiarity uh, really in some ways refers to different levels of sovereignty that are coming to be accepted. And uh, so in, in the Irish instance, even though there are huge problems that are still left to be solved, you know, there are um, uh, cross-border institutions uh, that are being uh, built which are extremely important and which would, uh, you know, serve uh, many other places like you know, Kashmir and India and Pakistan or Sri Lanka uh, or Aceh uh, or in fact parts of the Middle East including Iraq quite, quite well. I mean the whole question is how do you, uh, how do you accommodate you know, differences without making them, without reifying them and saying that these differences have to be only resolved by partitioning them you know, into separate entities. Thank you. I saw another question hand back here. Yes. Uh, I'm Anamika Twyman Gershaw from Northeastern. Um, first, just a comment for um, Ambassador Crawford Black. Um, I think the death count in Iraq is about more than 3,000. That just counts the American casualties. Um, and my other comment is uh, repeatedly the panel has talked about international opinion um, for, uh, about the U.S. Um, foreign policy being um, falling and dropping. Um, I think what we can see is uh, the U.S. government doesn't really take um, any notice of this. And my question is, really, why should it? So there is no bite of the international community anymore. First of, all, uh, first, first of all, I can't speak for the United States government. I'm not in it. But, uh, you know, uh, those of us that have children who are lieutenants in the United States Army, we pay real close attention how many people have been killed in Iraq. It's very disturbing. Um, I can't imagine that this whole thing was envisioned to turn out this way. And uh, the various aspects uh, to it. Um, but in terms of the bite, I think, uh, I think the American people, I think our elected representatives are deeply concerned about this, as are their constituents. You know, the, you know, the administration may need to take even a closer look at this over time, but I don't think it's lost on anybody, if I understood your, your, your question correctly. Let's go back here to the gentleman on the aisle. Uh, Ted Katouf. I'd like to, uh, well, uh, Dr. John Esposito noted a troubling trend in which he said basically 57% of the American people could not find anything good to say about Islam. And of course, we have polls out just recently indicating that uh, U.S. prestige uh, in many parts of the world, certainly in the Islamic world, is about as low as it's ever been. In terms of U.S. public opinion towards Islam, one thing that does trouble me a bit is that we've had the instances of the cartoons in Europe of the Prophet Muhammad met with perhaps very understandable anger, perhaps less understandable violence. Uh, similarly, uh, the Pope's remarks were a cause for violence in some places, obviously exploited by some actors in the region to deflect attention from their own sins. But at the same time, I'm wondering if some of the Western perceptions of Islam aren't shaped by the fact that we see these horrible mass killings, these uh, bombings in souks and markets clearly intended to kill lots of civilians, as Muslims. Uh, and we don't, at least here in the West, we're not hearing the voices of uh, uh, Muslim clerics, et cetera, speaking out. Now, that may be a more of a failure of the Western media than of the clerics themselves, but I'd like your take on that. <clears throat> I'll answer it in, in quickly in two parts. Uh, Tom Friedman wrote a piece um, about six months ago, nine months ago, 
uh, in which he uh, raised the question of, you know, why aren't there more Arabs and Muslims speaking out? Why haven't they spoken out against uh, terrorism? And uh, a, a colleague and I wrote an article responding to Friedman, which was never published, uh, nor was any response to that uh, thing published, in which we basically used my father's phrase, not quite using the exact words, which he used to use to his three sons, you're too bright to be that stupid. Um, and we basically took his statements and gave him websites where he could find all these statements and then said, then maybe there's another question you have to ask. <laughs> Thank you, God. Um, <laughs> I operate on multiple levels here. Um, but, um, but the reality of it is that people don't ask, why isn't the media covering it? And the question you raise very specifically is interesting because I'm looking at my BlackBerry coming in today from the airport, and what do I see? I see uh, a, uh, a Saudi who uh, was educated um, in, in uh, Europe, taught Edinburgh, uh, worked in Saudi Arabia, criticizing both Friedman, but also an Arab writer who basically raised the same question, but saying of the Arab writer, this is really amazing. It must mean that you don't read Arabic and that you also don't look at any of the Muslim languages because what he goes on in detail to talk about is the denunciations taking place in the region and in effect saying these are the important denunciations because if they're done in Arabic and, you know, and, the, and the local languages, they're, being, they're hitting the, the, the Muslim populations. But the bottom line to your question is it's not news. It really isn't. It, 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 it's a question that everybody asks. But media chooses. There was a major event in Amman last year where you had top religious leaders all over the world speaking out. Reuters had a substantive story. No major American outlet covered the event. Is there a equivalent of a memory for that sort of thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the, actually, for, to get a quick fix, go to beliefnet.com, among other places, by the way. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I know there are lots of other questions uh, from the floor. Uh, my boss has told me that uh, we must bring this uh, to a conclusion because we have a very important presentation uh, one minute from now at 6.15. So please join me in thanking this uh, panel for a very nice presentation.